This is the Food and Justice Podcast with Brenda Sanders. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Nicoletta Bettini, an economist and lead evaluator of the International Monetary Fund, about the major shortcomings in our food system, how food loss and food waste contribute to climate change, how animal agriculture threatens global food security, and so much more. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to Food and Justice with Brenda Sanders. Today, I'm so excited to have Nicoletta Bettini as a guest, and I just want to go ahead and read through her bio so that you can um, get more information about um, her work and and what she's been doing, and then we're just going to jump right into these questions. Nicoletta Bettini is the author of the book, The Economics of Sustainable Food. She is, she works for the IEO of the International Monetary Fund and is a scholar of innovative monetary and fiscal policy practices. She has become a leading expert in the design of macroeconomic strategies to deal with the climate change public health nexus with a focus on land use and food systems. She has published extensively in all these fields. Prior to the IMF, she was advisor of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, professor of economics at the University of Surrey, and director of the International Economics and Policy Office of the Treasury of Italy. She has handled extensive consultancy roles internationally. She holds a PhD in international finance from the Scuola Superiore Santana, and a PhD in monetary economics from the University of Oxford. Wow. Thank you so much, Nicoletta, for being on the show. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Great to be here. It's such an honor, and and I'm so excited to to jump into um, all of the work that you're doing around um, food and food policy and land use and just all the things that... um, are, are so instrumental to the kinds of work that folks are out here doing on the ground, trying to change the food system as it is and create a better, um, more just and more equitable food system. So I wanted to start off by asking you, as an expert in the design of macroeconomic strategies to deal with climate change and public health, with a focus on land use and food systems, what have you identified as the major shortcomings in our food system? Rick Brenda, if we think back at their evolution, it is actually hard to understand why currently food systems are under attack. Um, Early humans uh, really struggled to find food. About uh, 1.8 million years ago, our ancestors ate uh, wetland ferna and you know slugs for proteins and when they could they would scavenge on carcasses left over by other carnivores um, and for them that was a happy meal but after farming became uh, widely established about 7,000 years ago not that long ago yeah. feeding got a lot easier but for centuries agriculture remained um, a low productivity affair was dominated by small family business, uh, small owned farms, raising uh, a diversified mix of crops and livestock. But it all changed around 1950. So um, after the Second World War, governments uh, wanted to shrug off the traumas of, of food insecurity that ar- arose during the conflict. And so uh, government began pouring a lot of money into farmers' pockets to have them adopt machinery, synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, genetic manipulation, uh, you name it, and products and practices that directly repurposed sometimes some military applications that we had, like, you know, with uh, chemicals. Mm-hmm. And, and doing that, um, yields, of course, uh, multiplied uh, at that time, and food prices um, tanked, and Earth was you know, over the decades transformed in what I say a giant and cheap food vending machine. But if, you, if we think about this in retrospect, turning up the dial on natural processes as we did, as we do, to produce food industrially was, was not that smart. Maybe it was clever, but it wasn't smart. 
uh, because these policies uh, basically aimed eventually to increase our production of meat, of dairy, of eggs, uh, eventually led to complete replacement of the planet's natural wildlife with farmed animals. So that's the situation we're now in. So this is a first shortcoming. You may say, well, we need this, um, you know, animals to eat. But to make this happen, think about it, entire ecosystems uh, were brought to the verge of biological collapse through deforestation, soil degradation. So we basically trashed the planet mm -hmm. to, uh, to produce this kind of meat that we eat now. Uh, no renewable aquifers were over pumped, waterways and oceans were contaminated. Um, if you look from a, an, another perspective, which is not biodiversity and ecosystem uh, conservation and look at climate change, because animal production and all the crops that go into animal production uh, produce so many uh, greenhouse gases. Even if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow, which of course is impossible, food emissions from the current food system would push us two, three times over our 1.5 Celsius target by 2100. And it would make us basically miss our two Celsius target. Um, at the same time, third problem, factory farms as we raise animals now and do our food now uh, often and our, our constant interference with wildlife cause zoon zoonotic diseases. I mean, we have a pandemic on now. And worst of all, um, these subsidized food systems uh, leave, um, you know, they're, they're centered on the production of food for animals instead of for people, and sometimes for biofuels, leave a lot of people hungry around the world, billions either overnourished or malnourished, people sick from these diets, which are overpartake, hypercaloric. So a huge uh, wealth of issues in the public uh, health arena. Uh, last thing I want to mention, we have mentioned, you know, biodiversity, uh, we have mentioned climate change, we have mentioned nutrition uh, and hunger, but there's also huge economic costs because um, Chronically ill people, you know, both those that don't get enough food and people that get too much food and then get sick are both less employable and productive. And so cynically, you know, um, they, they produce less, uh, less uh, economic transactions, uh, which we count as GDP or GDP growth. And they also tend to retire earlier if they have a job. And that leads to a loss of income and a, a, a really soaring public debt. Um, and they and they're very unjust. They don't support these food systems. Don't support you know smallholders um, because they're heavily concentrated, globalized, and financialized. Um, and there is a concern now, Brenda, that agri-food companies have become too big to feed humanity sustainably. They're too big to operate on equitable terms with other food system actors, you know, like smallholders. Mm. And they're too big to deliver the types of innovation we need. So. Um, these are the shortcomings, and unfortunately, uh, all of this is bound to get worse um, because temperatures are rising, so climate change is putting pressure. We'll talk about this, I hope, on agriculture. Uh, war is becoming increasingly more scarce, and biodiversity is you know, disappearing uh, at very fast rates. And also, um, you know, population continues to grow, and and demanding, you know, especially those that didn't have access to animal food, they demand animal food. So we are in trouble. Uh, but the good news is that it's not too late to redress the food systems. And I hope we can we can talk about some of the solutions today. Absolutely. Wow. I guess I had never um, even thought about the concept of these huge agribusinesses being too big to provide for everybody. Like that almost seems like you know, like it, it's, you know, conflicting, like two conflicting thoughts. But, you know, when, when you say that they're too big to be effective, what does that mean? Well, too big uh, often is associated with uh, uh, high productivity and a lot of quantity. Mm -hmm. But the problem that we have now is that the too big is clashing with two uh, areas which is out of the, the domain, the control, 
and the interest of these this companies, which is natural resources that are needed as, a, as an intermediate input in the production of food. So land, healthy land, healthy soil, uh, clean, fresh water, you know, clean air, um, and a, a stable temperature. They, you know, they, they just um, put, you know, put their products out there, you know, their waste and the fertilizer discharge into uh, waterways. All that is slowly but certainly coming back to their own production. So it means the system that uh, big companies utilize, which is necessarily a system which is highly mechanized and, uh, you know, high on chemicals, is actually backfiring on the whole food system. So mm. if you're too big, you tend to push, you know, those uh, big, you know, production systems, which eventually make production impossible because they make it unsustainable. So that's that's kind of in a nutshell the mm. concept of why if you um, if you split production to smallholders, you know, they will make sure that their system, their land, their smaller farms you know, have, uh, first of all, the methods they use cannot be so destructive. And so when you sum them up, you know, the totality of them is going to make sure that production remains sustainable for us and for generations to come. Mm. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for for explaining that. Um, and, and then speaking of land, and we're talking about like, um, land as a resource, it's now being said that land is the new gold. And I saw that a, a few different places um, when I was looking into um, like food systems and people who are uh, studying food systems. I kept seeing this, this phrase, land is the new gold. Um, so what does that mean in terms of the current rush for land acquisition? So it's like this. Uh, most countries in the world, especially advanced economies, but also a lot of emerging markets, since they were, you know, the population was growing and they used these methods that we discussed and they helped, you know, these methods, these farming practices that are highly destructive and unsustainable to be developed, even when they weren't profitable, they sustained them. Uh, they basically ended up mismanaging land and degrading their soils. Mm and depleting their fresh water at home. Um, and as a result of this, many countries have become net food importers. Uh, you just have to look at you know, who imports food. And certainly probably one of the biggest one is China, but they also the US imports, funnily enough, is the second largest world exporter of beef, but it's also uh, the, you know, one of the first top two um, importer of you know, um, meat. So, because it imports different kinds of meat. Um, and so climate change is, is making this even worse. Countries find themselves that they can no longer produce their food. The land has become unfertile and they don't have enough water. Um, and so to alleviate the risks from food dependency, which is a foreign policy risk, think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, many rich countries like uh, China, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, over the years, but many other countries too, um, have bought land abroad. It's like an investment, to make like an insurance uh, through large-scale land acquisition, especially in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. Um, so the World Bank has studied this phenomena, and uh, often, whenever you know big flows of capital come in to purchase an asset, it could be you know just stocks, but it could be farmland. These, of course, creates, you know, changes in the exchange rate, which is, can be detrimental to the country that is being purchased. Uh, but mostly display, uh, in, display jobs instead of creating jobs in that country. And they also can end up harming livelihoods and, and people, uh, which are, you know, just kicked out of the land. So um, I can explain more of this and give you more details. But uh, there's, a, there's a book which I read, which is excellent by Jocelyn Zuckerman, and it's called Planet Palm. And this book describes what happens to a country, talks about several countries, when you know, big companies come in, they purchase the land, and uh, she makes an example of palm oil, where, you know, that requires great plantations of, you know, monocrops of, of uh, plants. Um, They're all the same, all, you know, genetically uh, engineered to be the same, and um, and people just to kicked out and fenced out. Um, and so what happens is that, you know, these phenomena 
a surge in the demand for land, plus the fact that the big ag companies we talked about all over the world continue to you know, incorporate smaller farms at a very fast rate over the past decades means that the price of land has been skyrocketed. And in fact, if you had put, you know, um, money in farmland um, in the last 20 years, you would have made a return in net terms of about 10, 12% per year, every year. So it's, it beat uh, all commodities, including gold, which we know went up a ton. Um, and it's, you know, it's becoming almost not accessible to young farmers or other people that want to go into the business of producing food. Mm. That's why people say land is the new gold. And then if land is the new gold, Brenda, food is a new oil. And so, uh, you know, we are in a situation where uh, some say, you know, we're peak water, you know, peak meat. Uh, we are really playing with fire here. Uh, and the prices are just, you know, the point of the iceberg of how scarce, uh, you know, our food systems and future food, food systems are going to be. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And I don't know that people really understand how dire the situation is. I guess maybe if you're not an economist or you're not studying the global food system, you may not even know that we're sort of on the brink of collapse. Right. Uh, I think people are, uh, you know, it's called asymmetric information. You and I, you know, we live in a neighborhood, in a country, you know, we go to a grocery store. I mean, we don't observe mm what's going on, you know, either at the national level, unless we do that as a job, as you said, or, you know, even more internationally. Uh, and there is, uh, of course, each country is on their own. And often um, a lot of the things we talked about, for example, this so-called large-scale uh, land acquisition occurring in countries that are, uh, you know, in remote places, very often these are in the you know, Southern Hemisphere in the lands which are, remain cheap and can be purchased relatively easy. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be aware of this, um, but you can rest assured that the big companies and the big players um, know about this. And, uh, you know, we, some of that is now showing up at the, at the grocery store. Um, you, you will have, you know, everybody's talking about the return of inflation. Of course, there is a pickup in prices, including on food, which is quite visible. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of shocking to me. Maybe it's just because I'm um, being naive, but um, the thought of these governments and these big corporations being able to go in and just acquire land that people are already living in, in you know, farming on, I wouldn't think that people that, you know, they will be able to do that. Like if, if people are already on the land, how is it that these um, government agencies or these governments and uh, corporations are able to just come in and purchase that land? And then the impact, like you were saying, that that has on the people who are living there, it, it's just like mind blowing to me. Right. So, um, you know, uh, large scale investments in land since uh, about 2007 have been scrutinized by civil society organizations and also researchers and other organizations because, because they create a lot of issues, as you said, right? Uh, issues of land insecurity, issues of compensation for purchase, the displacement of local people, the employment of local people, or uh, the creation of unemployment. And then the also the process of negotiation between investors and governments. And also, you know, lastly, but really importantly, the environmental consequences of large scale agriculture that this basically implies. These investments are made to pursue large scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. So um, to answer your question quite, you know, directly, uh, the, the issue is that in a lot of countries, and I lived in Peru and, you know, I, I know that firsthand, is, is the issue of land tenure. So uh, in our countries, like, you know, the United States, Europe, uh, land tenure, you know, if I own a piece of land, there's a piece of paper somewhere that says I'm the owner. But in a lot of countries and con even entire continents, there might be none of that. In a 2003 study, the World Bank estimated that um, less than 10% of total land in Africa is formally tenured. Mm. 
So people, you know, there are community kind of rules that say, you know, this village is entitled to this land, but there isn't a piece of paper behind it. Uh, and so uh, the lack of private ownership is due to government ownership of land as a function of national policy. That's, uh, you know, basically where it boils down. It becomes, you know, it owned by the government mm. by default. And also, um, you know, some of these countries have complicated procedures for land registration. And, and th there is a perception by communities that occupy these lands that customary systems, systems that have existed, existed for centuries, are sufficient. They remain sufficient. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, of course, that's not true. You know, if someone with enough cash comes to a government and says, look, I would like to purchase this land and nobody has a piece of paper mm. or a flag you know, <laughs> to put on it, uh, all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a much easier deal. Uh, so World Bank researchers have found that there existed a strong negative statistical link between land tenure recognition and prospective land acquisitions with uh, uh, also a smaller significant relationship for projects that eventually got implemented. So, you know, this is in the data. It's, it's actually, you know, significant, a significant relation we know when there's little tenure in a country that could be a target country for these purchases. Um, but if I, it, it, I wanted to add a few more points going back to the issues you mentioned, what, what, what does it mean for people? I mean, beyond, you know, being, what could we say expropriated from, you know, uh, uh, from their land or where they are being uh, living and their ancestors have been living and operating uh, well, first of all, there's the issue of consultation between investors and, and local populations. And often, you know, the researchers and um, civil society found that um, during these processes, the uh, communities are not adequately informed of their rights. You know, they don't have enough negotiating powers. Uh, they don't have entitlements within the land transactions. And uh, often the negotiation stops at the village chief level. Mm. but it doesn't trickle down to common villagers and disenfranchised groups. And so this, this same research I mentioned by the War Bank uh, found that, uh, you know, um, communities rarely aware of their rights. And even when they're aware, they lack the ability to interact with investors or to explore ways to use the land more productively. And even when these consultations uh, were conducted, often there weren't written agreements, they bring an example of Ghana when they, you know, um, when chiefs negotiated directly with investors. Um, often the negotiation had already happened with the government anyway, um, and so, you know, it becomes really tricky because if the ownership is not with with the people involved on the land, you know, it kind of gets out of hand and they can't control that process very well. Um, so, so this of land consultation compensation can be an issue. Uh, it's particularly concerning with consultation of women because women are often the main uh, worker on the land. Mm. And these studies, uh, and other studies showed, for example, in Mozambique, that large scale projects rarely included women in consultation and never presented official reports and documents for authorization by women. Mm. Uh, and so um, Oftentimes, you know, they found uh, that pastoralists and other displaced people were intentionally excluded from negotiations. Um, so, you know, one has to, you know, be realistic, but at the same time, the process can occur really fast and people cannot react in time. You, you almost have a, um, a little uh, perception of that when they want to do something in your neighborhood, right? Yeah. And that's at least serving. You're trying to react, but, you know, things are already underway. Imagine you know, in other realities where, you know, the rural law is different and there is even, you know, property rights are well defined in terms of land tenure. There's also issues of displacement um, because this, this acquisition lead to displacement of local people without adequate compensation, either land or money. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you read the book Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner, but we don't have to go to Africa or Southeast Asia or, or Latin America. You can just go to the U.S. You know, maybe 50 years ago, mm. and see what happened, right? And see what happened 
with uh, people that you know were displaced um, through projects, hydroelectric projects, or other, you know, army corps project. The the history of that, what happened to those population people that had you know ancestrally occupied natives that had ancestrally occupied these regions, is very well known and very well documented. And that book, I think, it's you know exceptional. Um, the last thing I want to mention is employment because a lot of people think, okay, well, this big fermentation farm, but at this, at the end of the day, they, they create a lot of jobs, right? But actually, um, that tends not to be what happened um, because the number of jobs created varies greatly depending on the commodity type and style of farming planet. It's highly mechanized. There are very little jobs. And if there are jobs, uh, World Bank found that they, uh, you know, they can be very little paid. Often they're below the poverty line, which is two dollars per day. So, huh. you know, these are huge issues, and um, which we maybe don't think about too much. You know, even when we drink a cup of co cocoa, or uh, uh, you know, we uh, we uh, use you know products, textiles, and, and food that comes from countries. Uh, a lot of palm oil is in that almost a lot of things that we eat, you know, how is that process happening? Who produces this and what is the cost for the, those population beyond all the things we mentioned, which are climate and health? Yeah. Wow. That is a lot to think about. And you think about all these things all day. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. No. <laughs> I try not to. I try to. It's very hard to take, keep them out of my head. Yes. Um, but it, it, it does afflict me because I'm trying to, like, you know, like you, trying to talk about it at least so that we can, you know, we can, we can find solutions. Um, we, and I think, I think we have a lot of good solutions. We just need to be, first of all, recognize that there is an issue. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Food and justice is made possible with support from Defund Big Meat a grassroots effort to encourage strategic collaboration across all sectors of global justice. Find more information about Defund Big Meat at www.defundbigmeat.org and A Well-Fed World, an international hunger relief and food justice organization advancing plant-based foods and farming to create a nourished and climate-friendly future. Find out more about A Well-Fed World at www.awfw.org. Thank you. So <clears throat> during our conversation, a conversation that you and I had um, about the problems with animal agriculture, you stated either the animals eat or we eat. And I was really struck by that statement. Can you um, talk about what you meant by that? Yes. So, um, so the word is in transition from an era of food abundance to a, a one of scarcity. I mean, most people think we, you know, food, we have too much food, right? But that uh, is probably true. Maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago, we had reserves, we had land set aside, you know, in various areas of the world that was used as a, a stabilizing mechanism of prices and, and trade balances. Uh, all those buffers have eroded in the last 20 years. And, um, and that shows up in world food prices. So we discussed, you know, food prices are now on an upward trend, which seems to have no end. And that is a sign of scarcity. That's the first sign of scarcity. Uh, this, um, you know, transition in turn is driven by two combined phenomena. First, population growth, you know, we expect to have an extra 2 billion people by 2050. And imagine having, you know, we, we add 80 million people every year to the planet. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and the second is a shift up the food chain of people with rising income globally. So as people become, you know, a little bit richer, you know, and they have eaten all their lives, a diet consisting largely of one or two grain staple foods, of course, they are very happy. Um, and rightly so to include, you know, more animal products because that's, you know, that's a considered and is a primary source of protein uh, for people that don't have access to nutritious proteins from plants. And eventually, as their income rises, they, 
um, you know, if you look way beyond, you know, that moment, but maybe 20 years later, 30 years later, and there are populations which are way up that food chain already, most of the Northern Hemisphere, people end up eating a larger share of animal foods and plant-based foods in their diets. So they eat, uh, you know, primarily that and high processed food that contain, you know, in a form or another animal food. Um, and so um, what happens is that, uh, you know, um, this is problematic for, um, for the overall kind of um, global table, let's put it this way. Uh, because the more we eat meat, the fewer people we can feed. Hmm. If, if everyone on earth received 25% of his or her calories from animal products, so a quarter, only 3.2 billion people would have food to eat at all. Wow. Okay, so just a quarter. So these are the numbers. I mean, we, of course, you know, well, I'm, I'm vegetarian. I think you're vegan. But I think, you know, let's take people on average – uh, eat a lot of much more than a quarter uh, animal products, right? Um, that's in the statistics. Um, but um, if you know, let's take the gl global average, which sounds you know very low, quarter, just a quarter. Um, we could only feed less than half of the population of the world. If you drop the figure, yeah, if you drop that figure to fifteen percent, we could feed four point two billion. Okay, so wow. that's how. You know, that's how that bar works. Uh, and, and I'll explain in a second why. If the whole, whole world became vegan, there would be plenty of food to feed us all. I think we could feed, you know, twice as many people as there are on the planet. So um, the World Watch Institute uh, has summed this up quite rightly, I think, saying meat consumption is an inefficient use of grain, mm. meat, all meat, of course, including poultry. And the grain is used more efficiently when consumed by humans. Hmm. Um, so it's just, it's as simple as that. Let's do the math for a second, Brenda. It takes up to 16 pounds of grain to produce 16 pounds to produce one pound of edible animal flesh. Um, and, uh, so according to the SDA and the United Nations using an acre of land to raise cattle for slaughter yields 20 pounds of usable protein and the same acre would yield 356 pounds of protein if soybeans were grown instead. So 17 times as much. Um, so these are the kind of the dimensions of the problem. Um, and so, um, you know, moving to having more plant-based rich diets, especially in countries that abuse uh, the use of animal foods against even their own health, mm -hmm. you know, it's really gonna solve a lot of problems. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's pure math. I don't think it, you know, it, it's not about the people that do it, you know, say these things because they love animals. People say because, you know, they're worried about diseases. But in, in math terms, you know, if we're adding people to the planet and the, the what we produce, crops that feed the animals and the animals themselves becoming, you know, less... Um, you know, less productive because of, you know, we have less water, higher temperatures, um, more desertified soils, you know, that math just doesn't work. We're going to be short of food and, and that, you know, we need to invert these trends uh, to make sure that everybody has food uh, in, in the future. I mean, including our own children. Mm. And breaking it down to simple math is very helpful. We can't feed everybody this way. I think that just just really sums it up and makes it much simpler. So thank you for no, that. We can't. And also there is another uh, wrinkle to this, which is really important. Uh, if you know the, you know, the whole stabilizing the earth system uh, uh, kind of paradigm rests on three kind of basic pillars. The first is to mitigate, to stop emitting and these gases in the atmosphere because they mm, block the heat true. and create the, the increase in temperature. The second is to sequester carbon because we already have too much carbon in the air. And, you know, if you project it forward, we also need to pull some out of the, uh, of the, of the, of the atmosphere. And the third, of course, is to think about, you know, reproductive rights and, you know, making sure that, you know, people don't 
uh, you know, have uh, uh, a number of children that can be fed and, you know, educated properly and so forth. And, and combining these three is going to solve the problems. We cannot do one without the other. But um, the, the, the carbon sequestration is an integral part of food system redressing because if we could reduce the land that we use for animals, for pasture or to grow crops that they eat, we can uh, relieve back into the wild that land and that will act as a carbon sequestration device of extreme power. So think about this, if all, if all the animals, you know, if we didn't farm animals to eat, we could return to the wild 75% of all the land farmed. So mm -hmm. it's just a really big number. It means yes. that we just hit all the targets in, in, in one go. Um, and there's a very nice documentary by Johan Rockström, who's probably the most famous earth scientist uh, on the planet, and David Attenborough called Breaking Boundaries, that talks about all these imbalances we created to the planet, these boundaries that they estimated that we've passed, we have moved beyond going into a sort of ice-breaking territory. And they say the only move that can fix the nine of them together and make us return to the center through the safe zone is redressing food systems. Mm. So that documentary explains very well why it's important to take care of our food systems okay. for people and planet. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. I just think that in my work, um, it's all about educating people. Like the, the foundation of everything that I do is about disseminating information to people who don't have that information. And so, and that's also what this show is about. Um, just there's so much that people don't know. And like, you don't know what you don't know. But then when you do know, um, I, don't, I don't know uh, if this is one of those things uh, that you heard growing up in Italy, but um, when I was growing up, uh, elders would say, um, now that you know better, you can do better. And, and, so, um, and so that's my goal is right. to make sure that people at least have this information so that they can make better choices and, and, um, and, and, and decide to do something different. And that's definitely the goal. So right. um, during that same conversation, you said something else that I found fascinating, which was um, we're exporting water through animals. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, it's very simple. So um, let's make the example of a cow um, on pasture. A cow would drink eight to 15 gallons of water a day. And the average, yeah, that's a lot of water. <laughs> I can drink all that water, but they can. <laughs> and the average uh, grass-fed cow takes 21 months to reach market weight. Mm. Uh, so a grass-fed cow, uh, if you do the math again, <laughs> will consume between 40 and 75,000 gallons of water in their lifetime. Okay. Um, and that's just the drinking. Mm -hmm. The cow eats as well. And it takes a thousand tons of water to produce one ton of grain. And so that means that producing the grain that is used to feed farmed animals requires vast amounts of water. Mm -hmm. And you have to send that to what the cow drinks, right? So importing grain or animals uh, is the most efficient way of importing water. And we did say that there are lots of countries that are now very scarce in water. India, for example, uh, in some regions of India, half of all electricity used is used to pump water mm -hmm. from deeper and deeper levels because the water tables have fallen to levels that cannot be reached. You know, of course, the Himalayas are, are, are drying up because of the melting of the glaciers. So they're, uh, you know, that water is evaporating and often not, you know, repercolating back onto those mountainous systems. And this is a problem everywhere. The United States, and we know water scarcity this year was terrible and, and so forth, right? Europe with wildfires. And, um, and if you think about, you know, countries that export animals, um, you know, basically what they're doing, they're exporting their own water. Mm. Um, so I was, you know, I was just writing an article in the U.S., uh, with a colleague from Iowa, the U.S. is the second largest beef and pork exporter in the world. Um, and those animals, you know, of course, uh, took a lot of water to produce. And that's 
U.S. water that's gone forever. Well, one has to, one has to consider these things. I think uh, when one thinks about the future and the future ability of a country to feed themselves uh, and drink and do whatever you need industrially with water, water is not just for you know agriculture. It's mainly for agriculture. About eighty percent of all fresh water on the planet is used for agriculture. Uh, but it's also used for, you know, urban development and industrial purposes. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it really puts a cap on what you're going to be able to do with your country going forward if you don't have water. And of course, you can desalinize the ocean, but, you know, if that could have been done easily, I think we would all have done it. Right. Um, you can think also in terms of of diets again. So you can put this, translate this into the dietary space. And it takes about 300 gallons of water per per day to, uh, some calculations say, to produce food for a vegan and more than 4,000 of water per day to produce food for a meat eater. Mm. Food and Justice is proud to be partnering with Afro-Vegan Society, Thrive Baltimore Community Resource Center, My Two Foods, and Better Food Foundation. bringing things back around um to to the public health side because you i mean your book uh the economics of sustainable food is just so chock full of just so much good information and it's just it feels like it covers everything um as soon as i had a question i you know it was answered in in your book and so um one of the things that you described was uh, this phenomenon of being stuffed but starving. Right. And I have seen this. I you know, grew up in the housing projects of Baltimore City. We did not have access to any healthy food. Um, all of it was processed, um, highly processed, salty, sugary um, animal products almost exclusively. I didn't even see fresh food unless we caught two buses to um to a market called Lexington Market um in Baltimore City and that would maybe happen once a month um you know when when we had the extra money to go to the market but otherwise we just got whatever was at the corner store and it was mostly just the worst possible if if it was a vegetable it was canned um and so and, and I just saw all around me people who were um you know who were bigger people, but not, they, they didn't seem healthy. They didn't seem nourished. They had all the, you know, uh, diseases that are linked back to dietary, um, and lifestyle. And so it was just like, you know, you're, you're obviously taking in all these calories, but so, so what is it that you're taking in? And that was always the question, you know, that I had, you know, of, like everybody around me who I saw, it was just like, you know, we're not starving, but we're not healthy. And so what was going on here? And I think that's the, the phenomenon that, that you're talking about. These diets are associated with diseases that we die of. And, um, you know, the, uh, it's, it's been proven in a lot of studies and the book has a chapter on this chapter five, which I wrote with Luigi Fontana. And there's evidence from experimental studies that many of the most common chronic diseases like cancer, or diabetes, type 2, uh, you know, cardiovascular diseases can be prevented, to basically eliminated in incidents are greatly delayed by dietary manipulations that limit the accumulation of, of these, um, these functions caused by diet. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates that if you eat the diet that is good, you know, with very little meat or no meat and proteins from uh, refined grains and plants and so forth, and a lot of fruits and veg and uh, et cetera, as we all know and hear and you know, have info on, um, you can actually eliminate uh, cardiovascular diseases, ischemic diseases by 90%, diabetes by 90%, obesity by 90%, and cancer by 30, 40%, all forms of cancer. So. I mean, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, if you care about yourself, 
uh, and, uh, and and your family that, of course, cares about you. Mm. This uh, even a little change can make a, a really a large amount of, of difference. And, uh, you know, one can feel like they ate. But the question is, did I nourish myself? Right. And did I nourish me appropriately? Yeah. And um, the things you mentioned about food deserts and prices are very important. That's why in the book we talk about government policies that redress these issues. People should be able to afford the right diet, the healthy diet, and they should be put in a position that they can access it physically and geographically wherever they live. That is food justice. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And so... You talked um, earlier about these uh, these pandemics that are triggered by zoonotic diseases, which um, I actually was not um, familiar with that term until I think the avian flu came through, like the bird flu came through uh, the U.S. And suddenly I, I was introduced to this idea that um, diseases can pass from animals to humans. And <laughs> I was floored. I was like, that is horrifying, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, but there is a connection since we're talking about the food system, there is a connection between these pandemics that are triggered by these zoonotic diseases um, and factory farms, which most of the, the farm, you know, most of the, the meat, um, or the animal products that we're eating, at least in the West, are coming out of factory farms, um, as well as the consumption of wild animals, which um, happens a lot more overseas, I think. Um, there's a connection, and it, I think it's an important connection. Can you talk about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, maybe it's useful if, if I explain, you know, we talked a lot about wet markets with, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 um, that is the cause of the current pandemic. So wet markets are named this way because they offer perishable foods like fruits and vegetables, uh, whereas dry markets offer only non-perishable go goods like, you know, um, household goods or like grains. Um, but some wet markets and a lot, of course, in, you know, uh, Africa, Asia and South America, they also have live animals. And these animals are often slaughtered in front of consumers because there's a belief and a habit that, you know, the, the livelier, uh, the fresher, right? Sometimes you get a restaurant and they pick, you know, the lobster from alive from, uh, from the fish tank to show you that it's very fresh I and mean, just live um, taken for you. And these markets uh, can be extremely crowded and usually with animals uh, and people. And usually they feature these long rows of outdoor stalls that, you know, set up side by side and with so many different animals, both alive and dead and humans close together. Conditions are science shows perfect for zoonotic pathogens, which is animal, as you said, animal born pathogens that can infect humans to develop and to spread and then to cause a disease because they're this interaction. The virus would try to jump to the human individual and maybe fails one time, but after, you know, several trials, you'll find a trick to get into our system. So mm -hmm. that's how viruses operate. Viruses are molecules, you know, they're not living uh, cells. They're just, you know, piece molecules that, that try the luck, you know, almost like in a brainless kind of way or a, a, an nth number of times until they succeed. Mm -hmm. And they mutate until they succeed. So this proximity uh, causes the, a perfect laboratory. Uh, as we know, you know, some theories say the COVID may have originated wet market in Wuhan. Uh, and similarly, the 2003 SARS outbreak, so SARS-CoV-1, was traced back to a wet market in China, Guangdong uh, province. And this virus killed, however, a much lower number of people, 770, so 770 people in 29 countries. Uh, but uh, you know, this, as you said, these markets um, are far from the only places where zoonoses have originated. In fact, all previous, uh, basically all previous, a lot of previous diseases that we know of, um, the flus, you know, the big flus pandemic have originated in, um, with farmed animals. And so um, the conditions in these farms greatly contribute to the creation of these pathogens, which are deadly, including the, the influenza viruses. And um, 
just a couple examples, you know, in 1980, 1990, and uh, the UK, I was living in the UK, tens of thousands of cows were infected with um, uh, a pathogen that caused the bovine spongiform enchilopathy, enchilopathy, the famous mad cow disease. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, millions and millions of cows had to be killed. Uh, and it created a big panic economically, you know, borders closed. Um, very serious, uh, you know, economic consequences to these things as well, in addition to the humanitarian one. In the spring of 2009, a new H1N1 influenza known as the swine flu was detected in North America, again, in a hog farm. And, uh, and the unique strain was likely due to the intercontinental tra transport of live pigs, which also travel in these extremely crowded conditions and sanitary conditions. And it caused a global pandemic. Hmm. Uh, almost 600,000 people died of the H1N1. And, and it continues to happen. You mentioned the 2015 uh, avian flu. Uh, you know, 50 million chickens had to be killed. People died. And it... It's the, 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 the principle of, uh, you know, proximity is replicated in these farms uh, as it is, you know, in, um, in wet markets. It's exactly the same principle that lots of scientific paper now show the similarity. So if we're afraid of wet markets and um, uh, the pandemic that can be generated there, we should be equally concerned of the way we raise farmed animals in confined operations. Mm. And as you mentioned, that's the majority of our animals that we eat is 98 99 percent of all animals that come to the tables are grown in confined animal uh, operation facilities um, these animals as we unfortunately know never you know see uh, grass in their life you know they're grown on cement often caged you know with um, very crowded spaces. Um, often there are rules, some rules about the maximum number of animals per confined operation, but unfortunately these rules cannot um, be enforced uh, frequently. So it could happen that there's a couple thousand extra animals in a place that should host, you know, 2,000, you can find four or 5,000. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, this creates an also enormous stress in the animals. It depresses the immune system, and the, that is a trigger for pathogens of all kinds, which we then, you know, acquire, uh, you know, in our own population through both their manure, uh, the meat, you know, um, the uh, and all the material that goes around them, and also the people that work on these farms that can get easily infected themselves. So, well, so it's also like a, a worker safety issue as well. Wow, Absolutely. it's just so, there's so much here. Um, so in your book, uh, you state that just as agriculture drives climate change, climate change creates severe challenges for agriculture. What are some, some of the challenges um, that climate change poses for, um, for agriculture? Well, well cl climate change is, is harmful for food production on several grounds. And um, so our farmers are one of the first victims of climate change. And they, they do know it. And they're very scared about this. Mm. Because nature, yeah, nature is, is a carefully uh, balanced system. And over the years, uh, humans have, have disrupted this balance, as we know. Uh, I can think of, you know, four or five reasons uh, by which climate change affects agriculture. So the first, um, most plants' fertility and productivity is very sensitive to temperature. There are actually curves of, you know, temperature, um, you know, healthiness of a plant by plant. Each plant is different, uh, like we are, more or less. But uh, when it's too hot uh, or uh, too hot and humid, plants can go into thermal shock and they stop producing. And so... Um, corn, for example, is, is extremely sensitive beyond a certain temperature. It just kind of freezes, like, you know, it goes into uh, almost a, um, a lethar lethargic um, situation from, a, from a, um, its own uh, production. Hmm. So, uh, you know, that means when you look at this climate change 
projections of future losses of uh, you know economic activity was was the economic impact of climate change 20 years from now 30 40 50 years there are quite some studies now that came out and quite a number of studies but some of the most famous ones estimate that you know by the end of the century we're going to lose a quarter of all gdp because you know of climate change when you look at what is causing that loss uh, a big share is agriculture because harvest will just collapse mm. um, both in quantity and nutritiousness of you know the the produce so that's uh, it's the link between temperatures and uh you know the ability of plant to produce and if a plant can't produce you cannot even feed the animals so then it becomes so animals suffer dramatically with temperature and so you know it's a chain everything gets affected uh, the second thing is that climate change affects biodiversity and so all the the web of life that allows to produce food is uh, of course interfered with by changes in climate because the temperature changes the acidity uh, of water just at sea but also on land and the, you know the uh, rain uh, precipitations changes uh, but also uh, you know um, animals react to temperature and changes to the earth balance by moving migrating uh, or also they become uh, sterile and so we have seen both because of climate change the rising temperature another phenomenon but also the use of fertilizers that uh, are you know one of the issues um, that uh, is actually causing climate change we've seen a dramatic drop in the population of pollinators which are of course essential uh, for food but also a lot of other animals that we need to produce food um, which are not just of course the you know the pollinators and so climate change affects that and through that you know it, it harms production and third and uh, there's this kind of myth that uh, co2 carbon dioxide is plant is is um, to have more of that because the climate change is good for plants because co2 is, is plant food right uh, plants absorb CO2 and make oxygen. I mean, we studied that one, you know, first in primary primary school. Mm -hmm. but, but recent research has actually shown that too much of a good thing is a bad thing, mm -hmm. and that yeah. in higher concentration, actually, CO2 is been now found to be a damaging pollutant for plants. So, um, in most cases, uh, plants and crops grew poorly when they're, you know, um, fed too much CO2, and they actually um, produce much less um, so more co2 is bad and then we have um, you know a couple more uh, things one is rain uh, you know rain now um, since aquifers are you know being depleted a lot of farmers around the world are turning to rain fed you know uh, farming because they have no more water under the ground mm -hmm. And, and rain, as we know, rain patterns are changing dramatically, right? There's either too much rain or no rain, and that affects harvests enormously, and it's completely unpredictable. I mean, look at what happened in Oregon, hmm. you know, regions that we thought, you know, were kind of safe or immune from climate change, at least for a couple of decades. You know, you have this phenomenon like heat domes and things we haven't even thought about that hmm. affect, you know, uh, situations there. And the, the last that I want to mention, which is really, really important, actually, is soil health erosion and desertification. So soil, because of the use of fertilizer, chemicals, and this, you know, tilling and monocropping has become increasingly, uh, you know, um, un unlively, if you wish. You know, soil is the combination, not, not just of minerals, but uh, organism, microorganism. They, you know, in most parts of the world, they, they, they're no more organism. They, the soil has become just like dust mm. and and yeah and so and that's progressively more especially when you know you can no longer have cows or yaks you put goats because that's another way to have meat but goats destroy you know land even faster or you just you know gr climb up a, a, an area that you didn't think you could use but now since you know this land is this soil is the greater you're going to go up that mountain by you know um farming that you create erosion and then you lose you know both that that little hill and the land below for good and and this process is just getting worse and worse and um, of course as the documentary became fam you know famous the kiss the ground that explains some of these mechanisms so the way to bring back uh, live 
life inside the soil is to go back to what we talked about, the uh, polycultural farming. So mixing crops and animals on pasture, you know, a few animals, rotating the animals and, and having um, the old way we farmed, basically. Um, that can um, bring back life to the soil. And mm. of course, stopping using pesticides and herbicides, which are, you know, uh, pure agents of death for these uh, rich, you know, uh, rich uh, set of microorganisms that nourish and live symbiotically with the roots of plants, mm. creating, you know, a healthy production system. So there are lots of interaction between climate change and agriculture. And uh, we know how to fix it. We need to do it before it's too late. And we do know how to fix it. Is that like a widespread, like regenerative farming is, is, is widespread knowledge at this point? It is. I mean, regenerative farming um, uh, is, is the way to go. Unfortunately, um, it takes many meanings. You know, to some people, regenerative farming is... Um, is just uh, you know maybe using some cover crops to others is going fully organic where you don't you know use pesticides and herbicides and you you create an integrated ecosystem on the farm so that you know um, the nature is completely restored uh, uh, to others it means you know rewilding parts of the farm and uh, you know farming the rest so I think there's a lot of debate. We can't go into that now, but generally a system which is much more nature oriented and ecosystem friendly than we have now uh, is, is the way to go. And, uh, you know, we should do that before it's too late. And that doing that is also going to fix climate change and water retention and a number of these phenomena that, you know, kind of feed back negatively on the productivity of the land. So land is going to become more profitable and the food we eat is going to be better and the people on the farms are going to make more money because, you know, there's a premium for good food. We all know that. We're all happy to pay a little bit more and eat something which not just doesn't kill me but actually nourishes me and my children. So I think there's, it's, it's a win-win-win-win yes. solution. Absolutely. Wow. And, and, um, you know, we kind of have to, we've talked about the food system, um, and different aspects of the food system, but we haven't talked about, um, I guess the end product. <laughs> um, and so I was reading in your book about, uh, something called food loss and waste. Uh, it was like FLW <laughs> was the acronym. Um, and, and so, how does food loss and waste uh, contribute to climate change and what can we do uh, to mitigate, to mitigate that? That's a, uh, it, it's a good question. It's a, also a very relevant question, Brenda. So in, a, in addressing food systems, uh, funnily enough, uh, what we do not eat may be as important as what we eat. And about a, a third, unfortunately, of all food that we produce is either lost during production or wasted by consumers. And wow. It's a lot of food. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, um, what we said about trashing the planet, mm. uh, food that we don't eat, it just, uh, you know, gives goosebumps. But they do say that if food uh, waste and loss was a country, it will be the third most polluting country in the world. Um, so food waste and loss or food loss and waste is, is the lowest hanging fruit here almost because uh, it's a tenth of all greenhouse gas emissions. And it's also immoral to let food go to waste or lost when so many hundreds, hundreds of millions of people every year, um, every day do not have access to food. So uh, there are different solutions that we discuss in the book for different countries because there are different causes of food waste and loss. In low and middle income countries, food waste or food loss largely happens within the supply chain. So when food is produced, it kind of rottens on the field or is stored improperly and then it goes bad or it cannot be transported fast in time to be usable or sold on market. So it's lost during the production and the post uh, supply chain process 
Whereas in wealthier countries, it, the, the waste or, you know, uh, of food occurs at the consumer level. So people either buy too much and they forget in the fridge and they find it when it's moldy, or, you know, they go to a restaurant, the portion's too large, um, um, or, you know, there's no system for restaurants that have excess food at the end of the day to, you know, give it to anybody and same with grocery stores and so forth. So um, in developing countries, strategies include um, public investment in weather systems to increase farming accuracy, mm -hmm. training in quality standards and storage, um, removal of infrastructure constraints. So you have, you know, bridges and, you know, roads that take you to markets fast. Uh, investment in cooling systems, you know, in hot weathers during the summer, we we'll make sure that food that is perishable is properly stored so that it can last. Uh, refrigeration, improved storage, and and um, in developed countries, policies include and have worked very well, and it's proven by a number of countries. We make country examples throughout the book on all the things we discussed of successful uh, uh, policies to to fight these challenges. And in developed countries, they, uh, we can think of education to foster a no-waste culture, especially starting when children are very small, portion sizing, food banks, and also regulation for, you know, retailers like restaurants and grocery stores and bars. And all this makes a tremendous difference. You can really make a dent. Another thing I saw recently is, is very smart is this um, dynamic pricing. So, there are now enterprises that come to big supermarket uh, chains and they tell them how to price things depending on the date of, uh, you know, expiration. Mm -hmm. So you may have two sandwiches, right, on the same shelf. And one sandwich expired in three days and another in five days. And most people go for the one for five days. And they go, oh, this is fresher. It's got to be fresher because it expires in five days and not three days. Mm -hmm. But they actually get two completely same sandwiches. I mean, they're edible, they're good, you know, they're, they're tasty the same. It's just that one was produced earlier, but it doesn't make the other one less fresh. So they price dynamically these two so that the one that is, you know, it, it's um, sort of uh, out of date in three days will cost somewhat less than the other one. And people will go for that one because mm -hmm. people also are driven by price, right. not just convenience and health. And, you know, um, that has dramatically reduced the amount of uh, waste in supermarkets. I mean, there's simple things like that. Yeah. Uh, but you have to, to go at them with an array of solutions. And uh, that's government policy. Uh, and also support of innovation to some extent of, you know, smart, smart way of doing things when we retail food. Okay. Well, I just feel better. I, I feel there, there was there was a moment <laughs> where I was starting to to, to feel kind of hopeless. But you know, just hearing you talk about the fact that there are solutions, practical solutions, things that we can even do now. Just just walking away feeling like okay, all is not lost. Um, that your book definitely doesn't have any kind of gloom and doom feel to it at all. I mean, some books do. <laughs> um, but no, you are providing, you know, uh, practical solutions. And I really, really appreciated that um, about your book. And so I just want to encourage folks uh, um, to go out and, and purchase this book because I was really impressed with it. It's called The Economics of Sustainable Food by Nicoletta Batista. And um, it's definitely one of those. It's a, it's a good addition to any um, library. Um, it, it's just a really phenomenal book. And thank you. Thank for, you, Brenda. Yeah, thank you for your work. Thank you for um, everything that, that you're doing and um, just compiling all this important information um, into one place so that we can learn and um, and then once we know better, we can do better, as they say. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, just to uh, conclude my side is that the situation is dire and it, it does get people a little bit depressed, like climate change, like many, many other things. But the, the book is about fixing it and showing how relatively easy it is to fix it. Mm. I also gives more hope because we can all make a difference. And so I encourage people to think about it. You know, reading the book will take you by the hand and, and show you the science and the solutions. And hopefully, you know, we can all make a difference together and individually. It was great to be here, Brandon.
Thank you so much. And it was so great. Yes, it was so great to have you on the show. Thank you again to Nicoletta Bettini for being on Food and Justice. Thank you to the folks who tuned in to this particular show. And hopefully everybody is going to walk away feeling empowered to do something uh, that will make a difference. So again, thank you. And um, join us again for Food and Justice with Brenda Sanders. This has been the Food and Justice Podcast with Brenda Sanders. If you're watching on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up and share it. Subscribe to our channel and click the bell to request all notifications. Or if you're on Facebook, please like and share the video, like our page, and invite your friends. You can also subscribe to the show as a podcast via our website at fjpodcast.com. Support the show. Visit our website to find out how you can become a patron. Thanks for tuning in and see you next week.